Colossians chapter number 2, verse 1. For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them that lay to see it. And for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Amen. Got me in there. Amen. Paul, Paul's thinking about the people. But he's thinking about the war, the battle that he's got going on to further the gospel. There's a lot of battles that will go on in your life to further the gospel. And you'll have great conflicts. There's no greater conflict in any man's life than when he's a lost man fighting the Holy Ghost while he's under conviction to convince him to yield, submit to allowing the Holy Ghost to save him. And Calvinists believe the Holy Ghost is going to overcome you. And then you'll be able to repent. They believe the Holy Ghost will regenerate you without your consent or ability. Then, after you, he regenerates you, then they believe that you can repent and believe only after he regenerates you. I believe that he won't quicken you. He won't make you alive until you get into this great conflict under conviction about who you are and what you've done and where you deserve to go. There'll be a battle over that, about your righteousness versus God's righteousness. And uh, man will fight that thing. It'll be a great conflict. It'll be a great battle. But when a man wises up and submits to the wooing of the Holy Ghost and says, okay, Lord, I, I repent. I am guilty. I'm sorry. The Holy Ghost will regenerate him, quicken him, make him alive at that point after he's repented and believed. Amen. That's a great conflict. And that's why it's so hard to go soul winning. It's not hard to go tell somebody about Jesus. It's hard to convince them of their need and help them to be able to see it. And if they're right and Holy Ghost is dealing with them, you may be able to make progress to where you can see a soul birth. But we got hyper soul winning out there want to bypass the great the greatest conflict there is between man and God trying to get them into heaven spiritual c-sections they don't want them to see through go through the labor if you have a new birth just like birth there's labor a woman goes into labor a church will labor a personal labor over that individual in prayer spending time over that individual wrestling with God over that soul and sow the seed and they water the seed, but God will give the increase. Hopefully, they'll come to church and hear old time preaching and get a chance to fall under divine conviction. <coughs> it's not always the case. My wife got saved. She's under divine conviction. Got saved in her part. Amen. She said, Did it take? I don't know. She's still serving the Lord 33 years later. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So, listen, the Holy Ghost can save people, but they got to hear the gospel. They got to have a good witness, a faithful witness. They got to hear the word of God. The Holy Ghost can save somebody if they'll consent. She was under such divine conviction in her apartment, she knelt down there, bawling her eyes out, and said, Okay, God, I yield. Amen. Amen. But the Holy Ghost didn't come upon her and change her until after she yielded the conviction that he was putting on her. That's a great conflict. But then there's a great conflict for sinners or saints to get to sinners. The devil's going to do everything he can. He couldn't, he couldn't stop you from getting saved. But now he's going to try to stop you from leading somebody else to Jesus or being a witness or effective for Christ. So there's a great conflict. <clears throat> then there's a great conflict between your soul and your flesh. That two natures. That's a great conflict. That's the hardest conflict anybody's ever going to have. Paul said you can't do the things you ought to do. Because the flesh and spirit is contrary one to another. Amen. That's what we are. We're contrary. And that's why I need preaching. That's why I need to be in church every service. That's why I need to read my Bible daily. That's why I need to fellowship, pray with God. That's why I need to do right. I need to be exhorted by other Christians to make sure I'm doing right by them doing right. A great conflict. And then last week we started, uh, not only there's a great conflict, but we have a great Christ. Amen. We have a great Christ. And we got into about the great God that created all things. We serve a great God. We have a great Christ. Flip over a couple pages real quick to Ephesians 2. We have a great Christ. 
My, my, my. We got the greatest God of all time. He died yeah. for us, gave his life for us, that we might inherit all things and all riches, have everything we can even imagine through him. He said he'd supply all our need. What a God. What a friend who'll stick closer to brother. Stay right there with you. Never go around telling all your secrets. Listen to your deepest secrets of your heart. Listen to all your wildest dreams. Never mock you and laugh at you. Man, what a friend. You can blow it. You can sin against him. You can humble yourself and cry. He'll be right there to pick you up loving arms. Love him. Verse 4, Ephesians 2, 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherein he loved us. My, 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 my. Mm -hmm. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. I deserve to be in hell. If God sat back and fully thought about me and you and what we deserve, he would have never even went to Calvary. He would have said, man, none of these people deserve it. But love, he said, you know what? I made them, and they got sin in their life. They're being hindered by the devil. He said, I'll provide a sacrifice for them, and I'll be that sacrifice. That they might be able to live and have life, and I can pardon them at that place I choose. And he chose a place called Calvary. And that's where God will show mercy to anybody that's willing to receive it. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, for any love is. We serve a great God that's got a great love. Let's go to Psalms 119. Psalm 119. He's got a great love. My, my, my. Bible said in Hebrews 2 3, for how shall we escape? We neglect so great salvation. Not only do we have a great God, we have a great salvation. He's got a great love. Now watch this. 165. Psalm 119, 165. Great peace have they which would. Love thy law. How, how do you feel about that book? How do you feel about your Bible? I'm not talking about the one that's full of holes. I'm not talking about an NIV. I'm talking about God's book, the authorized version. Great peace have they which love thy law. And what? Nothing, Nothing shall offend them. Well, I tell you what. That, that determine how you're walking with God. It's your reaction to things in life. Listen, I know that book, and I love this book, and I know God's in control. And I, I don't, I don't care what He calls me. I already know. I've already taken His side against myself. I already believe that I'm less than nothing, right? You know what nothing is? It's below zero, minus, right? It said, "Man, in his best states, altogether vanity." He's less than nothing. Isaiah 40 says, it "Means I'm below zero." I got no problem with that. I don't care what preacher says that about me. I've already accepted what I am. I already know what I am. You're not going to offend me by calling me some name. You understand? It don't bother me. Why? I love this book. I know what this book says about mankind. And I've accepted it. So there's no preacher who's going to offend me. Now, he may say something ugly about my wife and tick me off. Or something about my daughter or something like that. That's a whole different story. But you want to offend me? You're not going to offend me with this book. I love this book. What's it say? It says great peace. Let's look at something. Isaiah 26. Talks about his great peace. Boy, this world right now tonight, if they could just get a hold of this peace. The Bible said Philippians 4. Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen. People don't have peace tonight. They, they, they're longing for peace. You want peace? Being justified by faith. We have peace with God. That's the only way they're going to do it. Once you get saved, you get justified by God. God will fill you with his peace. Amen. Look at what it said in Isaiah 26, verse 3. Thou will keep him in perfect what? Peace. Whose mind is what? Stayed on thee because he what? Trusteth in thee. Listen, somebody that will trust in God... God will keep their heart and mind. People are out of their mind at night. They need liquor. They need dope. They need something. Oh, i got to have my nerves calm. No, you don't. 
You need to trust completely in God. You need to rest fully in Him. Right? Look at what it says. So thou will keep Him in perfect. That's complete. Whole peace. Whose mind is what? Stayed. You know what that means? It's settled. It's fixed. Somebody's mind is fixed on God. Well, I'll tell you what. God will give you perfect peace. Isaiah 32. Isaiah 32. People are looking for peace tonight. They ain't got no peace. They're trying. People say, well, I prayed that little prayer. It didn't work. The problem is you prayed a prayer instead of trusting God. Amen. Amen. Quit trusting a prayer. Quit pray, trusting what you said at an altar and give your heart to God. Say, God, here's my heart. If I go to hell, I'm going to go to hell trusting you and your shed blood, and I'm going to trust you with everything, my life, every circumstance, everything. I'm trusting you with it 100%. See what happens. People don't want to commit to keeping their heart sold to Him and trust Him completely. That's where salvation comes in, complete trust. Isaiah 32, verse 17, the work of righteousness shall be peace. And the effect of righteousness shall be quietness and assurance forever. Listen, people just got a hold of Christ's righteousness. They exchange their unrighteousness for His righteousness. Make that exchange, God imputes to them to righteousness of God and when God gives them their righteousness the peace of God moves in I don't understand it I don't understand why people are so worked up and all upset and they ain't got the peace of God commit it to him commit every sin commit all your trouble look at Proverbs chapter 16 people are trying to find reasons to get high and party and not trust God there's a bunch of people just Get a whole lot of mileage out of worry. <clears throat> they wear them walker chairs out. Amen. Isaiah 16. People. Huh? Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16, verse 3. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. People ain't got no peace in their brain. They ain't got no peace of mind. Why? They ain't committed to God. Right? We need people to get fully committed. I'm up and down. I'm in and out. Somebody goes, the other night a guy calls me. He goes, man, how, how in the world do you just keep going on doing what you're doing? I, I made a commitment to God. Yeah. I got saved. Then I rededicated, rededicated, rededicated. And I just stayed dedicated, committed to God. I've committed to keeping my soul to Him. I've committed my family to Him. I've committed my finances to Him. I've committed every walk that I do, everywhere I go. I've committed to Him my full pledge and trust. He's committed to be his full pledge and trust. My soul. How can I go wrong? There ain't nothing to worry about. When it's in God's hands, hey, he's, he'll take care of it. Amen. Why should I worry about it? Mm -hmm. so, what about my sins? Oh, I'm worried about my sins. Put them under the blood. Commit it to him. He'll take care of it. Well, I'm still thinking about it. Quit thinking about it. Commit your works to him. You understand? Psalm 130 or Psalm 31, 19. Well, I tell you what, God, God's a He's a good God. We've got a great God. We've got a great Christ with great love and great salvation and great peace. <coughs> I love this peace that He's given me. The past all understanding. Amen. It's like the eye of a hurricane, man. Everything else around it's going out of chaos, but you just be in the calm. Amen. I'm not upset at Obama being president. I just don't like the things that he's doing. You understand? I ain't worried about who's going to be the next president of the United States. I'm looking for the upper taker. I'm looking for the Lord Jesus Christ to come. Amen. I just monitor everything. I'm watching all the chess pieces on the board move around. Maybe one of us could be watching the man of sin stand before us, knowing how close it is. Wondering how close the mark of the beast is to coming? You know what they just said this week? They said all the credit cards issued after September won't have that magnetic strip on them anymore. You know what they're going to have? An RFID chip. Radio frequency identification. Next step to taking it in your right hand and your forehead. You won't be able to buy or sell without all that. 
We're getting close. Is he worried about? It? No. I just know he'll take care of me. Amen. He took care of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Ryan he took care of Daniel, took care of Jeremiah. He'll take care of me. What if he die in a FEMA camp? I'll die in a FEMA camp. <clears throat> you understand? What's there to worry about? I can't stop nothing. He's in control. I live by faith. He gave me a Bible, told me to pray. <laughs> Didn't he? He said, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and shall be opened unto you. Everyone to ask it, receive it. Everyone to seek it, find it. Everyone to knock it, shall be opened. Listen, I got great promises in the scriptures. He'll take care of me. Lord, give us this day our daily bread. I've not seen the righteous forsaken nor seed begging bread. Well, that's Israel. Well, I'm one of his children. I don't think he's going to let me do that. I believe he, he put angels on half rations to take care of me. I'm telling you, I serve a great Christ. Amen. Proverbs, or I saw Psalm 31. Psalm 31, verse 19. Oh, how great is thy goodness. Heaven, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee. Wow. Praise God. Amen. Which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. I trust God before the sons of men. I fear him. And God's got a lot of goodness set aside for him. Amen. Laid up. Amen. I might not be a millionaire. But it doesn't mean God doesn't have good things for me. And I'll tell you what. Just to be able to stick my arm out about that far, that's a good thing. Be able to get up. Be able to cough up a bunch of junk and flu. Amen. Have have some of the health benefits I got, the family I got, the church I got, the people I know and love. Man, God been good to me. Amen. He's got tons of goodness. Greatest life I ever lived in this Christian life. Amen. I couldn't ask for a better life. Being a Christian and being one of God's people, man. I'd rather be with God's people than anybody. Amen. Amen. You miss church, we're all sick. Get a little ice out here. Miss a couple days of church, come back in. We, whew, man, family reunion. Yeah. Just be around God's people. Amen. Amen. Oh, how great is the goodness which thou hast laid up for them. That fear. Listen, God's got a supply for us to meet our needs. He's just not always going to give us our wants and our lust. Especially if he knows it's going to corrupt us and hurt us and hinder us. Why would God give any one of his children something that would hinder them? He's going to give you what you need to strengthen you. He knows what you need to be tested in. Boy, what a test. God, increase my faith. Okay, then it's going to be tried. He's going to, he's going to pick out the right clown that's going to come walking in with the right. We'll test you. Oh, man. But you know what? It bless you. You understand what I'm saying? God wants to bless us. And I want to be blessed. I serve a great Christ that's got great goodness <laughs> for me. Psalm 119. Boy, I tell you, what a God. Psalm 119. I serve a God that's so great, so good. I like that phrase, ain't God good? They go all the time. Amen. All the time. All the time. I tell you what, you really want to enjoy the good and thank Him for the bad. Yeah. Recognize the bad that you got and then go, oh my God, I have been blessed. 156, Psalm 119, 156. Great are thy tender mercies, O Lord. Boy, I tell you, Great are his tender mercies. And then we covered last week the great things that the Lord has done for us. Let's go to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter number 5. We're just covering some great things God's done for us. Amen. Some great things about our Christ. Who are you going to compare him to, Allah? My soul. I wouldn't give you... I wouldn't give you 10 good Muslims for them. Amen. I, I serve a good God. Here's a man who was possessed by the devil. Gets his prayers answered. 
or everybody else gets their prayers answered but Jesus, I mean, but the maniac. Verse 19, How be it Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. See, that's what happens when a man or a woman or a child been touched by Jesus Christ. You know what they're going to do? They're going to go tell great how great things he's done for them. Hey, Amen. You don't have to have a fired up, super uh, sized soul winner to go out and try to tell the whole world about everything. You let somebody's heart been touched by God and let him go home and show his friends and his family, his co-workers and his neighbors. And they notice God done something for them in their life. They'll notice it. Wow, Jesus must have done something good because I know that rascal right there and his life's changed. Amen. He gives all the credit to Jesus, all the honor to Jesus. He gives all the glory to Jesus. Jesus touched his life. You know what? We'll just start bragging about the great things God done for us in our life. Amen. Been saved 35 years. Man, I wouldn't trade a mile of it. Amen. It's been worth every mile. It's been worth every trial. Amen. What a great God. He's done great things. You ever done something great for you? How do you know? Who you told? Amen. Just brag on him. We ain't talking about bragging on what you've done for God. Let's hear you brag about what God's done for you. Amen, amen, amen. John 5. John chapter number 5. John 5, verse 34, But I receive not the testimony for man, but these things I say that you might what? He said, He was a burning and shining light, and you're willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish. The same works that I do bear witness to me that the Father hath sent me. Isn't that something? Verse 20. The Father loveth the Son and showeth him all things that, that himself doeth, or all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these that ye may what? Marvel. John 14. <coughs> greater works than these. Now I understand there's uh, some works. There's a church around here called Greater Works. And everybody's got greater vision and greater works and all kinds of different things. And they think that they're doing greater works than the Holy Ghost than Jesus ever did. There ain't one of them turned around and fed 5,000 men with just a few fish and loaves. There ain't none of them walking on water. Right. There ain't none of them healing any maimed people. <clears throat> and Oh yeah, by the way, can I tell you this? There ain't none of them. It's healing every disease and healing every sickness. And if a thousand sick people showed up, every one of them go home healed. You can find that at Benny Hinn. You can find that at Ernst Angeli, A. Allen, or all that other clowns. Look at what it says, verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. You know what? I'm doing a greater work tonight than the apostles were doing and Jesus did at the beginning. Not one person that Jesus ever preached to before Calvary ever got born again. Because Christ is the firstborn of the Spirit. And when I preach the gospel and somebody gets saved, I mean, that's a greater work than even John the Baptist did. Amen. Yeah, John the Baptist came baptizing and preaching baptism of repentance with water. And men would be baptized. Amen. And they wound up having their eyes open that Jesus was the Messiah, but not one of them got born again. That's what we call being born of the Spirit. 
Not one of them ever received a death, burial, and resurrection until after Christ. We get in the book of Acts. Amen. You know what we're doing? We're doing greater works. Telling sinners how to be saved and they get born again. And a multitude of sins are being covered. James chapter number 5. If you convert a sinner, amen, a multitude of sins get covered. Well, that's a greater work. You talk about a great work. You talk about a greater work from a great God. Amen. Amen. God gives great witness. Titus chapter number 2. I know people's looking for a circus act. People's looking for a bunch of rock and roll music, jamming music, a bunch of hyped up prep rallies, spiritual pep rallies. Trying to tell you to get worked up in the spirit and the Holy Ghost can do all these great things. I'm telling you, it's a carnal show. Antichrist is going to appear. He's going to appear through a, a signs and wonders and healing ministry. All this circus stuff that you see out there, this charismatic circus stuff, all these so-called miracles from Betty Hinn and all them people, Todd Bentley and all them, I'm telling you, it's just a, it's just a forerunner for the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. Titus chapter number 2, verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. He's a great God. He's a great Savior. And he's going to soon appear. And take us home. And get us out of here. Amen. Somebody said you're looking for his appearing or you're disappearing. I'm looking for both. Sometimes my disappearing swells up a little bit more than love for his appearing. But I'm looking for them both. I want to disappear and I want him to appear. Amen. Amen. Let's go to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. We're just talking about a great Christ tonight. Some attributes about him. Man, what a great God. What a great Christ. You know, He's worth being ser served. No matter what. He's worth saying yes to. He's worth giving your all to. He's worth surrendering all and following Him. Hebrews eleven twenty six. 26. Well, it's verse, verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. That'll really test your heart. You willing to go suffer with the people of God? Or are you willing to just stay in Egypt and enjoy sin? You know how many people want to stay and enjoy sin? Second Thessalonians chapter number 2 says, They receive not the love of Christ. Why? Because they have pleasure in unrighteousness. They won't receive it. Why? Because they have pleasure in unrighteousness. They won't receive the love of the truth. Therefore, they'll be damned. They won't be saved. Verse 26. Esteeming the reproach of Christ. What? Greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. You know what he's got? He's got for me greater riches. You know what? If I'll suffer for him in the flesh, he said I could reign for him. And if I take a stand and suffer persecution and mockery and things like that, and maybe even become a martyr, Listen, he's got a great wealth of riches. He said, it's worth it. If you lay your life down and follow me, he said, I'll give you not only in this life, but the life to come. Well, I'll tell you what. What great promises. Greater riches. God's given me more. He can take my 90, my 85%, my 80%, and he can do more with that than I ever dreamed about. My 100%. Amen. I've, I've surrendered all to him, given all to him, and I'm still not laughing. I like what Brother Eastep said one time about Buddy Blunk. All he said, I think when we all get to heaven, we'll find out Buddy outgave God. Buddy had six kids. <laughs> Seven kids in a bus, trying to drive around the country. Somebody gave him a $1,200 offer, and he turned around and gave the offer away. He said, Buddy, you can't do that. He said, i got to make it on the road, man. i got to sell. i got to give. He said, God will take care of me. You know what? God meets Buddy's needs. Buddy's a great giver. Amen. Well, I tell you what, that encouraged me. Amen. Somebody said, Preacher, you can't do that. I got a sow. I got a sow. Amen. You think I'm going to outgive God? You think we can outgive God? You think we can outgo God? I'm telling you, He's greater riches. 
People looking at what they got to give up. They turn around when they hear a call to the mission field and everything. They look at their garage. They look at their, their boats and their cars and their campers and their fishing rods and their guns. And, and they look at their job and their monies and all that other kind of stuff. But they're looking at the wrong thing. They're looking at the treasures of Egypt. And when, when they see the mosquitoes and the malaria and the natives and they see all that other kind of stuff out there, they don't see lost souls burning hell. They just see hardship. But all those people that go over there try to reach them, folks, they don't see hardship. They see a great God. It's worth telling somebody about Jesus. And they're willing to count the treasures of Egypt as nothing compared to the sufferings of Christ. And they're willing to go suffer for Christ that they might have treasure in heaven because he's so much worth it. Because so, we serve a great Christ. Amen. Hebrews 11, right? Look what it says, verse 33. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant and fine, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting what? Deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. See, they weighed it out and they said, you know what? All this stuff ain't worth the treasures of Egypt. All this stuff, all this junk down here that moth and rust eat and corrupts. He said, we're going to put our blessings on the eternal. You know why God hated Esau and loved Jacob? Because Esau hated his birthright. And Jacob loved it. Jacob put his affections on the things of God. Esau put his affections on things of the temporal. Jacob wanted the eternal. Help me. Look at what it said. Others had a trial of cruel mockings and scourge and jay, moreover, of bonds and imprisonments. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. They were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute and afflicted and tormented. Watch this. Of whom the world was not worth. All those people that turned over and gave their heart to God, God said, this world wasn't worthy to have you walk on. Wasn't worthy to have you in their presence because you counted your life not dear to yourself, but for God. And because of that, God said, they'll get a greater resurrection, a better resurrection because they chose greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Of whom the world was not worthy, they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves. And all these, having obtained a good report through faith, perceived what? Not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Listen, those folks didn't receive the promises down here. And there's maybe some things that we claim promises in the scriptures might not come to pass in our life. But I tell you what, the greatest promise I got is that I got saved, I got born again, I'm going to see him, I'm going to live forever. My name is written over on the other side. It's in his book. I don't have to worry about that. I am saved, as saved as saved as can be. I cannot get unsaved. Why would you want to? Amen. Why would anyone want to get unsaved? What, I mean, why would those people left Egypt under the bondage of Egypt? Why did they want to go back? Why did they have false, mixed up memories of their minds? They go, oh, remember how good we had it in Egypt? Oh, yeah, under the taskmaster's whip. Mm -hmm. Why did you cry out to God for 400 years how bad you had it? Mm -hmm. And then he sends a deliverer. As soon as you leave there, you go, oh, we had it so good in Egypt. Oh, okay. <coughs> Amen. I don't care how bad it gets in the Christian life. What I had on the other side, before I was saved, I don't want it. There ain't nothing on the other side that the old man wanted to participate in that I want. Somebody said, man, you're missing out. You ain't getting no whiskey. Okay, well, I guess I'm not living then, am I? You're missing out. You don't have any Buddy Wiser. I like what one guy called it, Bud Dumber. But uh, I ain't missing nothing. Mary Jane ain't got nothing for me. A line of cocaine and ecstasy and all that ain't doing nothing. All I know is when I look at everybody that's practicing and using that stuff, their life's a mess. Amen. 
Well, it's the cops. They got nothing to do with the cops. It's ruining your life. You ain't got nothing to live for. I got hope. I got joy. I got life. I don't need artificial stimulants to keep me going and give me joy. I don't have to have a roller coaster spinning around 85 mile an hour to give me happiness and peace. I met Jesus Christ. I don't need a motorcycle going 150 mile an hour. You understand what I'm saying? I don't need all that stuff. I don't need artificial stimulants. I, I got no problem enjoying a football game or playing around to golf and enjoying life. There's nothing wrong with enjoying life. Nothing wrong with shooting a pistol or driving a nice car. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's not my life. Hey Amen. These people didn't receive the promises, but you know what? Hebrews 13. They had a great Christ. They chose a great Christ. People look at their circumstances and say, man, if that's being a Christian, I want nothing to do with it. You ain't seen nothing yet. Amen. Wait, you see my future two homes. Amen. Two homes? Yeah, I get a brand new tabernacle, a body. If this earthly house be dissolved, I got a house waiting for me in the heavens. Amen. Yeah, man. I got a glorified body coming, and then I get to go to a mansion. Amen. Well, I tell you what, God's got a city prepared for me. Woo! What, what do I want to trade it for? A $2 million log cabin down here? What would that do for me? You just got to dust a big house. Yeah. <laughs> you got to clean a big house. Right? A rich man's riches suffer him not to sleep. He's got to worry about everybody wanting to steal everything he's got. I ain't got nothing, so I ain't worried about people stealing. <laughs> Hebrews 13, verse 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. You know what I said? I got a great shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, but he's a great shepherd. Amen. A great shepherd. There's none great. He gave his life for the sheep. Look at John 10. I, we've already covered this, but John 10. I serve a great God. John chapter number 10. I got so tickled when the Holy Ghost revealed this to me. John chapter 10. Jesus says, verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. In this passage, he's a good shepherd. In Hebrews 13, he's the great shepherd. Look at what it says, verse 28. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my, out of my hand. My Father, which gave them what? Me. Is greater than all. No man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Jesus so excited. He said, and my Father, which gave them me. Woo, they gave, he gave them me. He just didn't give them salvation. He just didn't give them life. Jesus said, they gave him me. Man, I am the gift of God to you. And Jesus was excited that he was given the people. See, I have a personal salvation with well, the Lord as a personal Savior. Amen. And He took it a boat up in my heart after I got saved. And you know what? I serve such a great God. He's a great shepherd that He wants to have fellowship with me. And he loves me. And he's going to meet my needs. My, my, my. 1 John 3.20 And I serve a great God. I got the great shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me. That's a good one. 1 John 3, verse 20. For if our heart condemn us, God is what? God is greater than our heart. Amen? And know of all things, beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. Listen, God's greater than my heart. If your heart's condemning you, get over it. Confess your sin to God. Commit your heart to Him. Trust Him. And guess what? He's greater than my heart. Amen? But I feel He's greater than my heart. What's man's heart? It's desperately wicked. Amen? Deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? God's greater than my heart. 1 John chapter five, 4. 1 John chapter number 4. 
Verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they have God, because many false prophets are going out in the world. Guess what? You got a bunch of people out there that's got a Bible. Stand up and try to tell you. They know what God says. Verse 2, Hereby know we the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh is of God. That's talking about his deity, that he is God manifest in the flesh. Not that there was just a man here that lived on this earth, but Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. Compare that to 1 John 2, 22. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is coming to flesh is not of God, and this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, even now already is in the world. You're of God, little children, and overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Referring to Antichrist, referring to any wicked, foul, spirited person that's possessed of the devil. If you're possessed of Jesus Christ and possessed of a hope that's steadfast and sure through his salvation, greater is he, Christ, that's in you than he, anybody, that's in this world. He's not given us the power of the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. Amen. That's his power. He hasn't given us a spirit of fear. If you got a fearful spirit, it's not coming from the Holy Ghost. Amen.